Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, our host, and today's title is Election Denial is Happening Now. You guys re might remember um, Yogi Berra, a very famous New York Yankee catcher and uh, coach for the Yankees. Well, Yogi Berra was fair, uh, very famous for his yogiisms. And one of those yogiisms that everyone knows is called, it's deja vu all over again. Mm -hmm. So as I look at what's happening right now uh, before the election and Trump and J.D. Vance and House Speaker Mike Johnson um, starting to discuss the election and how it's already filled with fraud and uh, Reminds me to the days of before the election of 2015 and 2019. Uh, Trump was proclaiming fraud well in advance of those election dates. And in the case of 2020, uh, some of those proclamations that he made stuck. And uh, as a result, January 6th, we had an attack on the Capitol of the United States. So here we are again. And <clears throat> the bottom line is Trump is making headway with some of his claims. He's uh, basically saying that uh, the ballots that come in early, the mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania will sit around for 45 days and, and just sit there and more than an opportunity to either replace them with fake ballots or, or, or steal the ballots. He's also talking about, uh, and Mike Johnson as well, and J.D. Vance as well, has said that there's going to be flooding of non-documented immigrants who will vote in this year's election. And then, of course, he's had... Um, the poll counters or those that will uh, to demand that each and every ballot be counted before the election results are certified, if they're certified at all. So these are just a few examples of what's going on now before the election. And to discuss that, I have our special esteemed guest, Ben Davis, Emeritus Professor of the University of Toledo, Professor of Law, and of course, always my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning. Jay, I'm going to go straight to you on this one. You know, um, Again, we, we have Donald Trump saying that uh, there's the enemy within. He's referring to the Democrats. He's, he said it specifically. He's, again, as I said in the intro, that ballots sitting around, mail-in ballots should be challenged. Um, they're fraught with counterfeit uh, signatures or they're, they're fraught with dead people voting or they're going to be switched at uh, some opportune time or then thousands and thousands of non-documented immigrants are going to vote. These are all tunes that we've heard before. What else are you hearing out there this election cycle from Trump or Vance or, or other surrogates that are similar to the past but seem to be a, a nuance for this year's election? Well, let me start by saying what we're not hearing. We're not okay. hearing anything about the Florida case. We're not hearing anything about the D.C. case, the insurrection case. Um, we're not hearing anything about the Georgia case, nothing. Um, and we're not hearing about the uh, the 34 felony indictments in New York either. All of those things are dormant. And I find it interesting that here in the next uh, two, three weeks, we're probably not going to hear anything more about them. They've been forgotten. They've been covered over by the, you know, the dustbin of history. That's what we're not hearing. We're hearing a lot of his machinations. We're hearing a lot of his lies and conspiracy theories. And you're right to, to point out that, um, you know, the narrative he wants to portray is that there's fraud. That's the way he tried to portray it before. Um, and the fraud is it's a broader kind of um, conspiracy narrative about fraud. It's, it's, it's the immigrants who are doing the fraud, immigrants voting who are not entitled to vote, which is really a crock because that, that's legally impossible and it's administratively impossible. But he's, he's trying that out. The problem, though, is that that's not what's peeking from behind the curtain. Mm. What's peeking from behind the curtain is the hoodwink. In Queens, where he grew up and where I grew up, we called it a fake out. He's faking us out. He and his friends like Stephen Miller, they're expanding the lying now and they're expanding the conspiracy. Um, a conspiracy, by the way, is a bunch of lies. And now they're trying to distract us, to hoodwink us on an industrial scale. So the article you sent me this morning, Tim, the one by Neil Katyal in the New York Times is really very interesting because although we've talked about it on Think Tech, I don't think the media has covered it very much. Neil talks about the fact that we're going to be in a crisis, in a constitutional crisis, 
over this election. Um, we, we have um, state officials, federal officials, state legislatures, the Congress, none of whom can be relied upon to do the right thing. I'm sorry. Um, and of course, the courts, the state courts and the federal courts. So Trump and his acolytes are much better prepared now to create this crisis than they were in 2020. We are, I think we can assume from Neil's article, and he does, he's not usually as, uh, you know, as alarmist as he was in this article. Um, he's alarmist. So while Trump is dancing and making stupid remarks, and we're all treating that like, like a joke, like entertainment, the fact is he and his friends have things going on behind our backs. Um, the media is focusing on his dancing, um, but you know what's really happening is much more sinister, um, yeah. and uh, he is incompetent. And this is the, this is a second problem that flows out of that. It, it's not just that he's dancing and making ridiculous remarks and being mm, clearly unfit. He's incompetent. He could not run the country. And I'm reminded of uh, Woodrow Wilson, you know, who had a stroke in the last year of his presidency, and he wasn't running the country. His wife was running the country. Well, query, if Trump is in, incompetent on day one, who is going to run the country? Is it J.D. Vance? Is it Mike Johnson? Is it, oh God, all the jerks that have been around him? That is very scary. And how will we know when the press is locked out? How will we know who's running the country? We'll only get secondhand information. We won't be able to verify it. We won't be able to fact check it. And he'll be a shadow president with structured appearances, if at all, and somebody else in charge for four years and doing what he said he would do, all worse. So if you ask me how I'm sleeping these days, Tim, I'm not sleeping well. Welcome to my world. Uh, let me just tag on something, Jay, real quick. You know, one of the things that Neil Cartier said in his article, and it, it struck me as, as very serious, is that in many states, um, there have been some changes to election law. And of course, when there's, whenever there's a change to election law or any law, um, it's ripe for a challenge. And who's to say that those challenges don't come uh, the day after the election, if it's not in Trump's favor? And, uh, you know, these, these things present uncertainty. Uh, and certainly time. And the more time that you can stall election results or, or stall uh, an announcement of who's the, pre the, the next president-elect, um, it seems to me that there's an opportunity for chaos. Your thoughts? I would jump in and just say that I, I agree 100% uh, with the possibility of uh, chaos and cases after the elections. The thing that I've been reading about also is the number of cases that are happening before the elections on various issues related to the elections uh, in different states. Um, for example, down in Georgia, there was just a uh, judge down in Georgia who basically uh, overruled what the state voting board, was, the elections board was trying to put in place to have you know hand counting of the ballots and things like that. Well, that was a little shenanigan, right? It was an administrative shenanigan by the the Georgia election board that was challenged by, um, uh, you know, basically uh, vote vo people who want people uh, want pe voters to vote, and that was successfully challenged. But there's some other things too. For example, in Virginia, there's been a large number of people who've been kicked off the rolls, and that's just happened recently. Okay. And apparently there is a legal, there's a rule, there's a federal rule that says 90 days before elections, there's no changes that are done, right? But the governor of Virginia went ahead and okayed, you know, that all these people be kicked off the rolls. And I think the Department of Justice is starting to look at doing quick cases to make sure people are back on the rolls. So we let's start out with the counting, okay? Let's start out with who can vote, right? There's that. If you can reduce the number of people who can vote and have more of your people than the other, you, you, you start to shape the voters. It's always been done, right? But this is really like what I call industrial strength shaping of voters state by state. Then you have the, the uh, apparatus of voting, right? The, the actual people who do the voting, you shape the people who are the, uh, the, the vote, uh, the people in the polling places who are actually organizing the vote. You shape the polling places, like whether you can have 
drop in ballot, drop ballot, drop in ballots or not. Like some di different places, you've seen that there have mm -hmm. been issues about drop in ballots or not. And basically, and then there's the other rules about things like you can't give water to people who are standing in line. I mean, it's all these kind of efforts to kind of shape the. What you're presenting are are clear cases where a, a judge has said no. That's election interference, or that's that's not permittable. Um, the DOJ, hey, you're doing this within 90 days. Let me suggest that they know that those cases are going to be overturned, but those cases are just part of the narrative that Trump and Vance will say, hey, see, we told you the system's rigged. We right. told you that the um, we told you that the enemy is really within, and it's the, not only the the judges that are Democrats but also the Democrats themselves. The system's been cooked from the very start and uh, election day be damned, it's all, been, it's all been rigged beforehand. I'm just gonna go along with what's been the common theme of nine years with Trump. Projection, right? That everything he says is projection. So when he says it's rigged, that means that his people are in the process of rigging it, okay? But he's you know, throwing it on the, on the Democrats at so many different levels, I, I personally think at so many different levels, because, um, you know, he wants to guarantee that he's got a win, right? It's it's almost like going to the horse races and, you know, and having, uh, uh, you know, having a, a fixer there on, on making sure your horse is going to win. He's trying to use every element of the system, and he has people around him who are using every element of the system to put the risks of him losing lower. And then, on the other hand, you have Kamala Harris and her people who are trying to do the opposite, and that's the battle. The difference I see between 2020 and now is that now the Trump people were sort of outsiders challenging between November and uh, January. But now the Trump folks have been made part of the system so that the people who will likely be challenging are going to be more Democrats. And then it's going to be this whole battle about, well, the institutions, which are controlled by the Trump people, you know, we have to abide by the institutions. So that, you know, they kind of won by owning the institutions all the way up to the Supreme Court, unless there's a huge vote that really knocks, the, knocks Trump out, which I certainly would hope would happen. We had um, <clears throat> House Speaker Mike Johnson say explicitly, this is his quotation, I think there's going to be some cheating in this election. I think non-citizens are going to vote. Um, these are pretty damning accusations by that, the, the Speaker of the House, House of Representatives. Uh, do these overtures impact the voter population? Does it discourage people from voting? Or does it rile them up to say, hey, Trump's right, the system's rigged. Uh, you have the Speaker of the House admitting it as well. Um, it's not just Donald Trump's words, it's all sorts of people's words. Your thought on that, Ben? Whenever I see these these kind of comments, it's like at two levels, all right? One is, of course, to get his base up, right? Okay. But I really tend to think that it's, again, more projection. They're actually going to cheat, okay? They, they, the Republicans are in the process of cheating right now uh, in terms of trying to structure everything that's going on here. Um, um, uh, the, you know, the the the... Let's see the 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 uh, not undocumented immigrant statement there is you know to me yes it's trying to rile up the base but if you've ever listened to Donald Trump talk about undocumented immigrants who does he talk about Haitians people from Congo people from Venezuelans you know he never talks about the the famous you know. Irish who were here, you know, it's uh, never Europeans. So, you know, it's like a color game that he's playing at the same time. You know, like your town is going to be filled up with all these people of color. That That's basically what he's saying. In fact, one of the things that I, struck me was that apparently there seems to be a strategy of Trump when he goes to visit these little towns. You wonder why he's picking them. A lot of them apparently used to be what's called sundown towns. Towns where they wouldn't, you know, back in the 1920s, you couldn't have people of color who could stay beyond sundown. So obviously they're going to be very, very predominantly white places, right? Because that's the history, right? And, you know, and so it's like these things like that that are being played on to just, you know, 
gin up his base uh, and to gin up all tropes that America's had for a gazillion years. Um, and then there's some things that I find absolutely extraordinary, which is, it does seem to me, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, that as I listen to what's called the mainstream media, the mainstream media over the last four years, how can I describe it? There's been like kind of a tone change, which is like sort of like a, I don't know, anticipatory obedience. You know, they're, they're not all the way to Fox, so to speak, you know, but there's like a, uh, you know, we're quote unquote going to be more balanced. And they're, they're letting a lot of things get by that, you know, you would have thought that they might have raised like some of the stuff that Neil Katyal says. Ben, you know, Jay and I talked about that last week and why why it's perceived that the mainstream media is so compliant. Jay, would you like to describe why they're so compliant and why they're scared of being locked out? Yeah, well, if he wins, he'll lock them out. They'll never get back into the press room again. And they won't be able to report to their newspapers or media. And that'll affect their bottom line. So they're covering both bases. Um, you know, the other thing is, I, I, I've been meaning to say this for some time, is, you know, you talk about a tone change and this, this um, the thing about balance. I don't think the media is doing a good job. I mean, they, they do sane washing, right? You've heard that term. Um, they, they take some rational statement among, uh, you know, 90 minutes of crap that Trump will, you know, articulate or try to articulate. And now it sounds like he's sane. He's not sane. Um, but the media makes him look sane. And that's very troubling to me. The other thing is they've gotten, they've gotten into this rhythm of, of when it, they know that he lied, um, they say Trump falsely claimed. They, they throw the word falsely in. And that's very cute. But what they really need to do is, is make a separate sentence out of it. He claimed X. This was not true and was a lie without any evidence whatsoever. But they don't do that. They just throw the word falsely claimed. So, I mean, I think they're really being, you know, misleading, if you will, for a lot of people. I hope that helps you. The other thing is I, I want to raise, based on uh, what Ben was saying, is we have been mm, habituated into this notion that the only way that Kamala Harris is going to win this election is if she has a landslide vote. But why? Why is that the determining factor? You know, Trump is Trump and his acolytes, because I don't think he's alone on this. In fact, I think, you know, the people who are making these strategies are not Trump. But Trump and his acolytes are operating on two levels. One is the irrational, incompetent Trump, which he doesn't care about because he doesn't care what the popular vote is. He cares about winning and winning by trickery is just fine. Yeah. And what he's what he's focused on is the trickery, not the vote. So even if she wins by a terrific margin or maybe not so terrific, whatever margin, um, the the dispositive factor here is is what he's doing behind his back, and and I think uh, to answer your earlier question, Tim, um, you know his machinations about immigrants and Springfield and all that, it really ultimately doesn't mean very much at all. Okay, let me address that exact point because you know, ever since I can remember uh, in politics, it's demonizing the immigrants and their. There's always two things. One, they're always getting benefits that, you know, immigrants are getting benefits that they don't deserve. And secondly is they're voting. And this has gone on for decades. It's, it's, it's an urban myth that's right. really never been dispelled. And my point is that we know that every state is in charge of their own registration. It's not the federal government. Yet Trump blames the federal government of allowing uh, non-documented immigrants the voting in mass. And, and I guess the question is, why, once and for all, haven't the Democrats or the media um, dispelled this, this decades-old myth of uh, non-documented immigrants uh, voting in our elections? They're not, they're simply, it's not true. Right. Um, why, Jay, why do you think that that hasn't really caught on? Well, it's one of those points where, you know, the public doesn't really understand it, and it doesn't matter. What they want to do is undermine confidence in the system in general. All of this is a ramp up to that litigation that Ben was talking about, 
you know, and although Neil Katyal said there were dozens of lawsuits already filed by the Republicans, in fact, that's an understatement. There were hundreds of lawsuits already filed, and we haven't had an election yet. Um, they were ramping up by trying to undermine public confidence in every aspect of the system. And they'll use all of this, even quote themselves, to say the system has no confidence, it's broken. And that will be the mantra, the narrative that they try to sell to the courts and to Congress. Thank you, Jay. Hey, uh, Ben, it seems to me that the longer we know what the final count is, the more time delay uh, trying to determine the president-elect, the more opportunity that Trump and his surrogates have to confuse voters, confuse the population, uh, an opportunity basically to create some uh, strife. Right. And I'm thinking of the states of Pennsylvania. They were the last state in the last elect in 2020 to announce their results. Uh, certainly Arizona was. Um, do you agree that if there's a time delay that gives Trump an advantage? And if so, what would that look like? Or what advantage does he possibly get out of uh, delaying a final tally count of who's going to be the next president of the United States? If we start with Pennsylvania, you know, all the early votes that you're seeing coming in right now, there's the law in Pennsylvania says they can't be counted mm -hmm. until the night of the election, right? Correct. Well, in other states, they can start counting them already. So it's it, structurally, Pennsylvania is got to be late because you don't have the ability to count the early votes, all the other votes that same night, right? So that's the kind of thing that somebody like Trump will exploit. To the, the time in between will be used to argue there's some kind of machinations going on, some secret stuff going on in the back room. You know, the what was the Ruby Freeman was, you know, passing mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, whatever the story is going to be or the stuff in Detroit that happened and all that. Secondly, of course, you know, you, you do have the operatives, right? The operatives will try to gum up the works. But now some of the operatives are actually in the room doing the work. While back then you had fewer of those people, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, I fully expect that there will be uh, those kind of shenanigans in, in particularly every... Um, every um, um, uh, battleground state. There is a thing I do want to say, though, which is really tough to say, but I'm going to say it because if you take Michigan, right, there's a large Arab American population in Michigan that is generally voted Democratic. And I think that, and I said it at the time, that at the Democratic convention, Kamala Harris should have done something more with regards to the Palestinian Americans who've lost family in what's going on in Israel and all that. And that's sticking in the craw of a, a significant vote group in a significant state. I don't know what's going to happen. Not necessarily that they're going to vote Trump, but they might sit it out. And, uh, you know, there could have been something done a little differently at the Democratic convention to make Michigan maybe be more likely to vote uh, towards her. And that's one of those key battlegrounds that she's looking for. Well, um, so, you know, that's like, that's not really something to blame on Trump. That's a choice that was made mm -hmm. at the actual convention. You know, and I, I just thought that, you know, I lived in Toledo, Ohio. Okay. And knowing the, the folks uh, around there was a significant number of uh, Middle Easterners that uh, Middle Eastern Americans, you know, that, Mm -hmm. it's like you don't feel their pain, they will remember that. And, uh, yeah. and it, you know, no matter what, you know, how you feel about it. But they, and so I think that's, that's something uh, that, that, that I could think of as maybe an error. I don't know how bad an error it is, but I think it was an error done at the Democratic Convention. Yeah. And you know, one of the ironies of my life is watching things like that, right? You know what I mean? Watching things like that happen and saying, and I wish we could just do a little better than that, you know, just a little better than that. You know, recognizing, recognizing um, the horror, okay, and the humanity uh, for everyone. You know, some guy, I don't know, he's lost 100 members of his family, right? You know what I mean? That's yeah. enormous. You know, I mean, yeah. you can't, whatever you feel, it's just, it's enormous. Those, those, those hostages, you know, it's all, and 
By the way, there's another thing, which is we haven't even talked about the international dimension, which is, you know, sort of the stuff with regards to, uh, I don't know, was it the Russians or is it the Iranians or whoever, you know, all the disinformation stuff trying to be done to influence us here. Good right? point. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about, you know, in some theory, I, I was listening to something today that was saying that basically, you know, if we take the the wars that are going on right now, Israel, Gaza, uh, West Bank, and Lebanon, right? That Netanyahu thinks that he has Biden in his pocket, right? And so he, and the longer he can keep those things going, the less chance that he's actually going to go to trial about his corruption scam. I mean, yeah, it's like no, that's it's, cynical, it's a delay you know? tactic for sure. Right. And then another one, you know, is, is you can see, you know, with Putin, right? You know, the way the whole thing is working out between Putin and Ukraine and all that. I mean, they, they, there are these big things that are happening right now to give us a feeling that the world is unstable, right? And I yeah. kind of get this feeling like a lot of those things are related to trying to influence what happens in the American elections to see which way we go and to hopefully get Trump back in office. Right. Um, because they know that they can get what they want the authoritarian types know that they can get what they want i don't know this you know I, i'm not yeah. sitting there in the kremlin or something like that or sitting in in, in with uh, netanyahu but there's a little smell in my mind that's saying there's things going on here like you know we talk a lot about iran right but behind iran is who russia let me take that point about um influence and certainly in social media jay um jd vance said that uh, in the last election, that's why he won't admit that Trump lost the 2020 election. His, his standard answer now is, look at the, um, the Democrats, through the use of manipulation of social media, I'm thinking he's thinking of Twitter and Facebook at the time, um, they squashed the First Amendment rights of, of, of the public, of the voters, that they weren't allowed access to see certain stories about Donald Trump or, you know, they were basically, those stories were thrown off social media. He said that was a violation of the First Amendment. That had an influence on the 2020 election. So that's, that J.D. Vance response to every reporter's question about, did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? And that's his go-to answer. But uh, the question is, to Ben's point, to what degree is social media influencing things that we aren't seeing this time around, maybe, that we did see in 2020, do you think there's a remarkable difference in how social media is getting uh, its point of point across to the voting population? Absolutely, totally. How can I say that? 200 percent. You know, a few weeks ago, we had all these stories in the paper about how Russia and Iran and China uh, were affecting uh, public opinion in the United States for this election with using social media, uh, making people divided, making them irrational. Um, so why do we not see that now? Did it stop happening? Right. Why is the press not covering it? Uh, I am greatly concerned about that because I think it's tangible uh, and it's discoverable and it's happening right now. You know, and you talk about Michigan um, with the uh, the Muslims over there. Talk about the black community in this country. Um, they're divided. <clears throat> they seems like to me more divided than they were. Do you think for a moment that somebody out there could be trying to divide them with social media, divide Absolutely. them so that say, a good percentage of them would vote against their own interest? Do you think for a moment that Trump, who, who barred all Muslims on the day he came into office, that he would help them? I don't think so. Do you no. think he would help the blacks? I don't think so. No. He, he's not for human rights or civil rights or the so, you know the social safety net or anything like that. Um, so I you know I think they they are being asked and encouraged to vote against their own interest and to divide. And this right. is exactly what Trump wants. He wants to divide. You know those seven telephone calls that he had with Putin. They were not about what, what the weather was, you know. Right. Um, there was more to it, and Putin is actively helping him. So is Iran, and so is China. Question, because to that point about the phone calls, uh, I don't think I've heard one reporter ask Donald Trump, so what was it that you talked about with Vladimir Putin? 
Have you heard anyone ask that question? Um, all I've heard is Donald Trump said, well, I'm sure if, you know, if I had those calls, they would have been of worthwhile value. Basically, that was what he was saying. But um, we, we don't know if he was getting election advice in the last year and a half. We don't right. know. I mean, and we can speculate, but we don't know. I know in my heart, Tim, I know what he was talking about. It was the same thing with the Ukraine scandal that led to the first uh, impeachment. He was trying to get Putin to help him. Um, and Putin did help him. And, he, you know, he used the whole affair as a way to advance his political capital. And he's doing that now. You know, we talk about all these things. You, the things that we've touched on in this discussion must be seven or 10 or 12 things that he's doing. And he's got a big blackboard somewhere where he's doing them all simultaneously. And one of them has got to be social media that try to divide people, divide the country. And this goes to something we were talking about before the show, and that is violence. You know, if you have chaos, to answer one of your earlier questions, if you have chaos, that works for Trump because Trump can, you know, create more confusion, more consternation, get more courts, especially the Supreme Court, involved and create, you know, a, a lack, a further lack of confidence about the result only works in his favor. And that means insurrections, you know, talk about projection, Ben. He would project an insurrection against the government, even though he is our, our number one insurrectionist in the world. What you have here is the very high likelihood of violence where he would indeed call in the army. Um, and, and there would be blood Wait, on the streets. Time out, time out. Um, how can Donald Trump, who's not president of the United States, who's a private citizen at this point, call in the army? How, how is that possible? I'd be interested in Ben's answer to that because he's a law professor. But my answer is it's de facto um, on if he claims to have won uh, on uh, November 5th, he's going to claim to be president from thereafter. And it doesn't matter about an inauguration. It doesn't matter about, you know, arguments in court and the like. He's going to take control of the situation. He's made that clear. Mm -hmm. No, you, you know, day, very day clear. one is day one is not January twentieth. Day one is December sixth, and right. and I think you're going to see that, and the violence will come um, way before January twentieth. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, just you know, keep in mind that um, every state's got a militia, right? And their governors in every state who are seem to be very aligned with what Trump wants, right? So if Trump says jump, well, the governors will go how high? And I could see state militias being called out absolutely to suppress things. Uh, and then you get the issue whether Biden is going to federalize militias. Where have we seen this before? How about Little Rock in 1956, yeah. right? You know what I mean? It's this, I mean, but it, the, the, that same dynamic, so to speak, um, I, I could think would, would, would happen uh, would would be the way he would be able to do things as of November 5th. Do you think the, the federal government is ready for that? Do you think they're preparing for that? I do think that uh, there is uh, the, the people who worry about national security events, you know, are gaming all of this out, gaming, uh, they're thinking about all these things. The question for my mind is more, it's not so much whether they uh, are doing it, but whether they are doing it thinking of the scale of what might be going on in terms of the, 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 the battles between different parts of our structure that, that may happen. I mean, there's the violence, I like to call it the violence of the sort of our, uh, court processes. That is the kind of violence, even though, you know, it's not hitting people, but it's the violence of suppressing people's votes that's a kind of violence you're not necessarily hitting people but you're you know but there's also like violence in the street i have a theory you know i may be wrong but uh, no matter what happens there's going to be violence if trump loses there'll be the people who supported trump in the extreme right who will be violent if trump wins you'll have the people who support him in the extreme right who out of hubris will be violent you see what i mean it's just because that's the a part of his chaos thing and his dark image of it it's like violence is a place he likes to go that's the thing that the that attracts him to people you know it's like you know i don't know the dark night kind of vision you know that mm -hmm. people like they're the, the people who get attracted to this kind of 
sinister stuff um, and to be close to that kind of power and to be wielding that kind of power, you know? Right. Okay, you know, we've run out of time, so Ben, I'm gonna ask you for your last thoughts on this topic. And, um, you know, uh, give us your best. Okay. Uh, I, my, it's really simple. Everybody vote and do not vote for Trump. Do not vote for a third party. Do not sit out the election. Because if you think that you don't like Kamala Harris, Trump is so much worse. Everything, you know, whenever Trump says or any of his people say that all these people are the enemy within or they're saying that they are communists and all that, you got to understand this is coming from a place. I'm telling you, I read it about it, that people of kind of people in the extreme right who would have said that Eisenhower was a communist. OK, I mean, this is how far over these folks are. Mm -hmm. And you, we cannot have fascists running any part of our government. We just can't. It's too dangerous in this world. Um, and you either resist it the best you can, or we will be having this kind of 1933 Germany moment. I really feel like that these days. Yeah, I was uh, taken when uh, a four-star general, Mark Milley. Yes in Bob Woodward's book explicitly stated that Donald Trump is a dedicated fascist. And you don't see generals say those kind of things. No, you just don't see that. So your point is well taken, Ben, and I appreciate you. I said, ask, I asked for your best and you gave it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jay, your last thoughts and words. I agree it would be a fascist state. It would be a state of oligarchs. Trump is unfit. Uh, I think we have to you know, hammer home on that. He, he can't serve. He won't know which end is up. Other people will be running the government instead, and they will do Project 2025 or worse. The wealthy will get big tax breaks. Immigration would be upside down. There would be no human rights, no civil rights, and your children in school would be asked to tell on you, just the way in Nazi Germany, and people would wind up in jail. I mean, that that is certainly a different world. The army will will be the brown shirts, uh, the Nazi troops. Um, there would be no social safety net, uh, Medicare. Uh, all the benefits that have gone to this disadvantage in this country will go away. There will be no environmental protection. The environment will essentially fall apart, not only for the U.S., but for the world. And we will be isolationists. NATO will be gone. World War III will be here in technicolor. So, and I'm very worried about that. And I think that that's what we will see. There will be no guardrails on Trump or his acolytes. He will do whatever he wants. This would be, you know, a term where he doesn't have to campaign for anything. Just do whatever he feels like doing on a given day. It's terrifying. All right, we'll leave it there. I want to thank my special esteemed guest, Ben Davis. And I would like to thank, as always, Jay Fidel, my co-host. Thanks. This is American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. And until next week, aloha. Mm -hmm.